thank you for coming to the session entitled Crafting a Ground Design for uh, Economic Security. I was expecting that there will be a less audiences on this session because of the lots of attractive uh, you know, session has been simultaneously going on in the other rooms. But I'm glad to see so many uh, are here and uh, that tells about how much that uh, attention has been paid to this uh, subject of the uh, economic security. Moreover, we have uh, attractive panelists uh, who offer uh, something very valuable uh, for uh, this session. Um, this is the second subsequent year that the G1 Global deal with the subject of the uh, economic security. Uh, in 2021, uh, we talk about the US-China strategic competition, how the competition overshadow uh, the economic domain, and how the business community address, reconcile, or even take advantage uh, of the rise of uh, economic security. And we had a very lively discussion uh, last year. But for this year, uh, the world become enormously fragile. Um, take example of the, for example, the supply chain uh, disruption. It derived not only from the regulatory measures taken by either US or Chinese government, but from the, you know, um, the crisis in Ukraine and the global sanction imposed on Russia uh, that really uh, impacted a lot of uh, businesses uh, around the globe. Take example in Asia, you have a Myanmar, and also those global pandemic that we have for, suffer for more than two years, uh, still lingering uh, as the major disruption uh, of our uh, you know, global supply chain uh, issue. So I think uh, certainly uh, that requires the deeper uh, discussion among the wider stakeholders like uh, people gather uh, in the G1 Global. So it will be great uh, opportunity to deepen uh, our discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to start uh, with Robert. Um, I rely on you uh, on setting up the ground of our discussion on, uh, especially on where we are. And what are the backgrounds and developments uh, of the economic security concepts and where we are heading uh, in the years to come, Robert? Um, uh, just saying how wonderful it is to be here and to see people I know and people I don't know as well to make new friends. So uh, great to see uh, be in an event where there are actual people in the same room. That's always a, a treat. So wh where are we in terms of uh, economic um, security? There's something we're looking at uh, in great depth actually at the International Institute of Strategic Studies where, where I am. Um, and. Um, I think the key thing uh, that sort of triggered uh, interest in economic security, and this is really something that's just happened over in the way, in the sort of in the intensity that we have now over the last few years, uh, and that's the rise uh, of China, and and most geopolitical uh, roads actually lead in some way uh, to the rise of China, uh, and one of the reasons this is important for geo uh, for economic security is because China is a geoeconomic power. Um, and this, is, this, this really does differentiate it from the Soviet Union, which is obviously the previous great sort of great power rivalry uh, period. Um, China is embedded uh, in the global uh, economy. It uses its, uh, its what we call geoeconomic endowments for coercive purposes and also for, as inducements. Look at the BRI, for example, as an, as an example of, um, as, uh, of its inducements. Uh, China is so embedded uh, in the global economy, it is in your pocket. Um, I, I got a, my new iPhone the other day. I was setting it up in the, in the shop, um, and the default location was People's Republic of China. So China is very much uh, embedded. But China also wants to challenge uh, the, the status quo. Uh, so you have this sort of unusual combination of uh, the second biggest economy. It may or may not become the biggest economy. I happen to believe that China is now declining as an economic power, but it certainly is a continental-sized economy, and it's embedded in the global economy, and, of course, it wants to challenge um, the way that the, uh, the world is set up from its point of view. Um, the second point of my three points is um, why this matters is because uh, of the convergence of military and civilian technology. Uh, I think in the old days it was safe to, safe to assume that um, the direction of travel was from military to civilian. Now, however, you could say civilian to military and actually these two areas are converging. 
Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, AI, for example, quantum, all the things that are needed to drive uh, a productive ec economy are also needed uh, on the battlefield. So you have a situation where some uh, civilian companies in the tech space could actually inadvertently uh, be, uh, in effect, be security companies uh, as well. Uh, China has no problem with this. China has civilian military fusion. Uh, America has its uh, military industrial complex, of course, but Japan, because of its uh, historical circumstances, does, uh, does struggle with this. Um, you can see this actually writ large in um, Russia's war against uh, Ukraine. Um, this sort of link between, techno between technological superiority uh, and military effectiveness. Um, look at what's happening as a result of US export controls, the difficulty that Russia has in feeding. Uh, the high-tech bit of its, uh, of its military uh, operations. So it's very difficult now, I think, to separate uh, economic security uh, from uh, broader national security. Um, I do recommend, if you've got one book you're going to, I, I'm going to leave you with, um, it's Albert O. Hirschman's uh, book that he published in 1945, um, and it's still available uh, in, in, I think, print-on-demand, called National Power and the Structure of Foreign Trade. And he was writing about the pre-war... Uh, policy of the uh, of the Nazis, Nazi Germany, and he said here, which I think is really important for all policymakers to bear in mind, and I think more and more are now. Uh, there is no such thing as purely economic relations with a totalitarian state, um, and and hence again the importance of economic security. Um, and the third point I just want to make very briefly on the international approach to economic security. Uh, Japan has been innovative, I think, in trying to calibrate uh, its response to uh, what's, go what's going on in the outside world, partly driven, I think, by Japan's unique strategic position. I think uh, in the first session we talked about uh, Russia in the north, uh, North Korea in the middle, and you've got China in the south. So on the western flank, you have a sort of wall of, of threat. And I think this has driven some innovative thinking uh, by, uh, by Tokyo. Um, just two more points uh, on this particular issue of the international response. Um, I think you can divide it into sort of in, uh, defensive and offensive uh, economic security. On the defensive side, which has a bit of offensive in it as well, uh, look at the, uh, all the policies re with regard to semiconductors. Um, the US seeks, I think, dominance in semiconductors because of its size. It's a superpower. The EU seeks autonomy uh, in its semiconductors. Uh, China seeks its Made in China 2025 policy success. Uh, Japan sees strategic indispensability as part of this. The UK is sort of floating around in the middle somewhere, a little bit uncertain, I think, of, uh, of where to go. But what all, this what all this, these, these different approaches suggest is that uh, economic security requires friends. You can't do it on your own. Uh, being autarkic is not necessarily making you more secure. If you just depend on yourself, you also have, in poten you have potential single point uh, of failure. So I think this is a key point in our recommendations uh, later on that I'll certainly be uh, st uh, stressing. And my last point um, is on the offensive side. Uh, and, and what we've seen with, uh, a, with the response to Russia's war against Ukraine, I think has surprised everybody uh, in terms of its cohesiveness, the range of sanctions, uh, the, the, the breadth of the coalition of sanctioners um, has been absolutely uh, unprecedented. Um, but it also comes, I think, has a, ha, will, will have a side effect on the strength of multilateral uh, organizations. Think about the WTO, for example, how that's been sort of sidelined by the, by, by the, uh, by the sanctioning countries um, and so on. And it's very difficult, I think, I ask lots of my interlocutors about w when sanctions may be lifted or eased, and, and no one I talk to uh, thinks that is possible in, in the, in the medium, uh, short to medium term at all. Um, so this, and I think this comes to the, back to my final point on the fragmentation. Um, I think all of the, what I've been talking does threaten uh, to drive uh, fragmentation in the global economy. Um, and as I think we said in the Esper Coles panel, um, that fragmentation, I think, will lead to uh, a bit less innovation or certainly threaten to and perhaps uh, drive certainly less global growth. So I think businesses are having to operate in a radically uh, different uh, external environment. Excellent, Robert. That's really comprehensive. And uh, your three major points, uh, rise of China, uh, dual-use technologies and international response. 
uh, certainly set the ground of our debates about where we are uh, in the economic uh, security. And I think, I, I know Kazuto may have lots of response in what the robot have uh, just mentioned, but let me try to uh, squeeze uh, some of uh, specific questions that I like to uh, lay out. Um, as uh, you know, Robert mentioned about the offensive uh, side. Uh, we uh, used to call it weaponization of the interdependence, and uh, which has been exercised most symbolically uh, by China. Uh, we also talk about how effective the sanction uh, against Russia, uh, and that is also creating the common fronts, how effective we can be by using a you know economic tool uh, to materialize uh, what we how we can really respond uh, to the current crisis. So it seems that uh, the economy as a tool uh, became the frontline ammunition uh, in the international relations. So um, I'd like to ask uh, Kazuto-san, uh, do you think this change of the concept of the power uh, that the nation state uh, is all about, uh, you know, how, how the nation or the government uh, can reconfigurate the prioritization uh, of the power in the realm of the economic security? Um, thanks, Ken. Um, I, I think this is a great question, and I think there are a couple points that I'd like to make, uh, mention. First, the weaponization of economy is, yes, indeed the weaponization, and it is the me me measures to put the pressure on the other countries. But however, the effectiveness of the weaponization of uh, economy depends on the receiving side. Because the economy, uh, for example, the North Korea. North Korea has been under sanctions for many, many years, but nothing has changed. There is no, no hint of denuclearization. And it is largely because there is a determination, there is a resolve that the North Korea will continue developing its nuclear and the missile capabilities. So there has to be a translation from the economic pressure to the political act. In, uh, that's the difference between the military um, militarization or weaponization. You know, using a military weapons, it directly destroys the willingness and the capabilities to continue working to, uh, to for certain things like um, you know denuclearization. If you destroy the Yongbyon. Uh, uh, facilities, then uh, it's it's impossible. But the economy has a little effect uh, or or late effect, so that um, you know it takes time, and you can't really expect that the economy, uh, the economic sanctions or economic weaponization will have the similar uh, effect as the military weaponization. <coughs> The second point is that you need to have the sets of toolbox um, because the United States, for example, is, has the largest military in the world and it's, it has the largest GDP. But the problem is that it doesn't really have the effective weapons to, uh, to enforce uh, the, the weaponization to others because it requires the certain capabilities and it requires some um, the the counterparts dependency so the weaponization can be effective only when there is a very strong dependency and many countries like china is dependent on the united states as the market but not as the suppliers but for the uh, russia the, the Russia as a supplier of the natural resources, the China, you know, rare earth and the other stuff like, you know, the, uh, the material. China has a lot of leverages to, uh, to enforce the weaponize, well, to weaponize the economy, to put pressure on others. Whereas the United States, they are very limited. Uh, for example, the uh, semiconductor issue, the United States need to have the en uh, you know, enclosure of this um, uh, semiconductor technology of the ne Netherlands, the, uh, Japan, Taiwan, and, and South Korea. So United States requires the friend uh, or friends and allies to work together 
to make it as the, the weapon, uh, whereas China alone can have the power to in, enforce the uh, weaponization. And that is also true for Japan. Japan, although it has some indispensable technologies such as uh, uh, carbon fiber or, or, um, <coughs> or some sort of a material, but, uh, but it's not exactly the, um, uh, you know, the menu for the weapons are very limited. So I think how to develop the, the weapon uh, to, to be offensive is a, a question and how to coordinate and, and get alignment with the other friends and allies is, uh, is an important issue for finding out who has the power in this weaponized economy world. Excellent, and I think that that's because why the Japanese government has come up to the two iconic concepts called the strategic autonomy and the strategic uh, indispensability to promote the logic of the economic security promotion law, which we're gonna uh, discuss in, in a few moments. Um, but given that the, what the Kazuto-san has uh, mentioned, that uh, in order to be effective uh, in the economic security, you have to have an interdependent world. Without, you know, if, if the nations are isolated, there is no means that you can be effective uh, on this regard. But how much you can really weigh uh, the effectiveness uh, depending upon the level of the, in the interdependency you have, but what kind of leverage uh, you are uh, actually have in relation to uh, those. and and. Whenever I talk about those relations, uh, I think we really need to take the case of China. And very fortunately, the Bidasan uh, has been uh, specialized on Chinese uh, economic security uh, measures. Um, her um, doctoral thesis is about uh, network analysis of the Chinese uh, business political uh, relationship. That was a wonderful work. Uh, and also recently she uh, also wrote uh, the excellent article on the Chinese uh, economic statecraft. So I would like to hear from you about your take on where China is at on the economic security. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'll try to incorporate what I've heard because I think some, some of the very important elements have been uh, mentioned already. So uh, at first, let me give you a little bit of a broader kind of well, long-term uh, overview of what economic statecraft of China has been, which I think goes contrary to, to uh, what some of us might be thinking. So in a long-term perspective, when we look at Chinese economic statecraft, which is basically use of economic tools to reach well foreign policy or uh, national security goals, um, there are two different, uh, two different sets of tools, which would be negative and positive. And if we look historically at, for example, the United States, negative, which is sanctions, would be, would be the tool which, well, uh, uh, the tool used more often than the positive ones. The positive ones, uh, and that's what actually China for a very long time used to, well, kind of prefer or to put uh, uh, emphasis on, uh, the positive, well, the incentives, right? Economic tools like uh, foreign direct investment in certain countries, uh, financing development projects, which would be in specific regions, like in, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, or well, in, in Asia as well, and as well as in, in, in Europe, by the way. Um, I said, well, foreign direct investment. Also, that's for a long time that has been seen as, well, a positive side. I'm looking now at the things from European perspective probably, but that has been considered as a very positive development in bilateral relations with China. Uh, and the perception was that that's, that's an improvement. That's an advancement in, in a country's uh, uh, economic security, well, more in, uh, incoming investment, right? And what has happened, well, China obviously has used it for its own economic purpose, uh, sorry, uh, foreign policy goals and uh, well, national security interests sometimes. Especially if we are talking about Europe, uh, which once again uh, uh, embraced at first European e EU member states also embraced investment coming in from China because that seemed to be like a, 
uh, for some countries may be a very significant well, contribution in their development. Um, the perception, and I want to emphasize this word, and I hope we will return to this like, perception of the economic threat or threat to a country's economic security, the perception of this economic tool used by, by China, a tool in its economic statecraft, was for a very long time, well, for a relatively long time, I would say, uh, positive. And uh, so, but uh, yes, let me, let me make this point that the important thing was that China was more willing to use those positive tools and they were perceived rather positively. They were not seen in the beginning as a, as a, uh, as a threat. To give you an example, uh, in Lithuania, until 2018, until around 2018 and actually summer of 2019, China was seen purely in economic terms. That was an opportunity for a small, like, well, small country's uh, development, investment into the, into the port, Klaipeda port, if any of you might have heard of it. Um, and that was, well, highly welcomed. Again, when seen from Chinese uh, Chinese side, that was a tool it's in its well in its toolbox to attain economic tool to attain uh, uh, well foreign policy goals. Would it be pressure on uh, Lithuania's stance on Taiwan or any other issue like in in the EU right human rights uh, uh, issues, for example, and EU's uh, pos position. And the important point I want to make here is that if we look historically, China's use of those economic tools, well, positive and sometimes negative, has changed, not recently, but, well, since from around 2007. What has become very obvious, that China is willing to use more negative tools, like sanctions. And we've seen it in, in the UN, in multilateral frameworks, but we have also seen it in, in like, well, bilateral relations of China. And probably the most recent example would be uh, would be Lithuania. And well, I happened to, to take a look at it because most, like many uh, kind of inquiries, came uh, about Lithuania as the the bilateral conflict uh, emerged. Just to give you an uh, well kind of update of what what has been going on between China and Lithuania, a small Eastern European country, a member of NATO and the EU. Uh, Lithuanian government has decided, well, basically to reorient its China policy. It withdrew from cooperation framework with, uh, of China and like cooperation framework between China and the Central and Eastern European states. And at the same time, last spring, which was like around uh, May last year, it announced that it would be strengthening relations with Taiwan, well, economic relations. But the major issue here was the, the way, how those relations with Taiwan would be strengthened. And Lithuanian government decided to allow Taiwanese, Taiwanese authorities to open a, well, basically de facto embassy under a very unconventional name, which was a Taiwanese representative office in Lithuania, which is, which is unprecedented. There are other 18 EU member states which have, which have similar office in their capitals. None of them has this name. It's Taipei uh, representative office. China's, well, if we see at this particular case, right, China's Chinese objective, China's foreign policy objective was, well, to prevent this from happening. Obviously, like, well, the reference to Taiwan by the name of Taiwan, that's an issue. And, uh, well, the, the reason I'm giving you this example is what measures China was able to take. And I think this serves as a very good explain, uh, illustration of how economic measures can be used as a weapon, what, what uh, has been uh, discussed already, right? And well, in my in my view, that was unprecedented. Unprecedented in terms to what extent China was actually capable, as a state, as a party state, to enforce uh, its well decision or policy on its own companies. So what happened in Lithuania? Uh, Lithuanian companies started complaining actually pretty early, even with before the official reorientation of the um, of the policy towards China. Lithuanian companies started complaining that their counterparts in China would be canceling pro uh, projects or suspending, sorry, orders, or suspending uh, orders uh, for unlimited uh, time until it becomes clear what the government next regulation on a certain issue is. But that started happening, happening on a pretty significant uh, scale. Uh, what happened after the, the office was actually opened, like in a pretty secretive matter, manner under this uh, Taiwanese representative office name, uh, China, well, China basically, in China, Lithuania as a country was deleted from the uh, customs clearance systems, which meant that all the, uh, well, all the shipments were just stolen, imports and uh, exports likewise. 
And the most interesting thing when we think about China's uh, economic, well, economic statecraft and its ability to use economic tools to achieve foreign policy goals and other goals and how it can be used as a weapon. The important thing is that it was very, very well targeted and industries, at least that was the report from the um, uh, Association of the Industrialists, that exports told of those products which were crucial for the Lithuanian manufacturing sector. So it wasn't the regular goods well, the, that supermarkets would sell. It was specifically those components or raw materials that were very, very necessary, like crucial for the, for the country's manufacturing sector which is, in my view, an excellent, excellent illustration of what, what, to what extent the state is capable on using economic interdependency as a weapon. It was more of a warning, I would say. It didn't, like, well, now the imports, uh, exports from Lithuania to China are more or less stopped, uh, with, with, an, uh, uh, with a few exceptions, like copper and its products, but generally, that shows the, the ability of the country. And that's what I meant before, maybe we can come back to this in the discussion, that it changed the perspective in Europe, well, in Lithuania at first, and actually within the EU too, which I think leads to also our, our major question, right? Will we see more fragmentation? And obviously this will lead to some realignment, this experience, and finally the perception that yes, this country is able to, well, to uh, use it as a very effective tool against other countries. We will definitely see more fragmentation or realignments across different lines. Yes, thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Bida, for uh, introducing the detailed case of the China-Lithuania uh, relationship. And I think those kind of detail uh, example exemplify how the you know economic statecraft of China has developed over past years. Whenever they link those uh, economic engagement policy with the national goals like uh, Taiwan or uh, you know, some core interest that involves the Chinese, um, uh, you know, external relationship, uh, that entails every, uh, you know, economic measures that they originally, uh, you know, engage in, in those country. And they have uh, changed the perception of many uh, European countries in the, in the large scale in, in the past years. And uh, I think that really uh, gives us a very good examples and lessons learned uh, from what the BIDA has uh, now described. And I'd like to come back to Japan uh, as a case uh, once again. And uh, in May, we have just passed the economic security promotion law uh, in the diet. Uh, basically, in order to promote uh, our regulatory measures on the uh, expo control, intellectual property rights, uh, and how much we can really um, uh, maintain our industrial base of the critical uh, technologies uh, and else. And uh, basically, that is also a response to how uh, do we adjust uh, ourselves uh, in the US Japan. Uh, you know, strategic uh, competitions and how much those kind of French shoring uh, processes uh, that uh, supply chain review can be uh, made available among those uh, friendly nations uh, of the United States uh, and Japan uh, could be materialized. But uh, let me, let us know, Kazudo-san, uh, what has been the major uh, kind of achievements uh, that the Japanese government has set out uh, with the legal ground that we have prepared, and what are the remaining agenda uh, that we still need to address? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, there are, there are lots, of talk, lots to talk about. Uh, just, um, well, initially, I'd I like to um, add what I've said, and uh, following to what Vida has, uh, has discussed, was that even China has the, economic, the power of economic statecraft and you know, the power to impose economic sanctions. There is always the, some sort of a pain, economic pain for China itself. For example, when uh, China tried to you know, uh, put pressure on Australia and um, stop importing the coals and, and, uh, coals and uh, uh, iron ore, um, the problem you know, occurred that the China has lack the supply of the coal, therefore, you know, uh, there was a, a shortage of electricity. So the economic sanction, uh, as you can see today in, in, in Europe, that, you know, if you try to impose the economic sanctions, there's always something in return that you have to bear some, you know, pain in, uh, 
uh, in, in this process. So that's, again, similar to the military weaponization that, you know, if you, if you start the war, your, you know, countrymen are going to be killed in the, in the, uh, during the combat. Um, so there is always a pain uh, in this uh, conflict. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, coming back to the, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, economic security promotion law, there are a couple of things, well, there are four major pillars, uh, resi supply chain resilience, the protection of the uh, critical infrastructure, and the uh, concealment of the uh, patents, and the promotion of the uh, science and technology policy. Each of them are very important, but just uh, coming down to the reason why Japan is doing this is because, well, initially we had an experience in 2010 that China has uh, has stopped exporting the rare earth mineral to Japan, which are essential for the Japan's automobile industry. So that was the first time that the Japan experienced the such an economic coercion uh, that is exercised by China, so that the Japanese economic pro, uh, economic security promotion law is focusing on these, uh, you know, uh, intentional uh, intentional actions by other countries. So the this is somewhat different from the the, the language that is used in the United States because the un United States people are talking about the disruption of the supply chain by typhoon or or hurricane or you know what uh, the COVID or what what have you. So so uh, these in unintentional things are included in the U.S. languages, whereas in Japan, it is more focused on the intentional attempt of the uh, of stopping and using the economy uh, economy as a weapon. And uh, so the it, the other interesting part of this uh, Japanese uh, economic uh, economic security promotion law is that there is a very uh, intensive discussion between the government and the businesses. In the United States, these measures are taken like a unilateral from the, uh, from the government, whereas in Japan, there's a, there's a lot of discussion so that the government is trying not to intervene as you know the, the processes of the, the businesses. And uh, business, um, particularly with regard to the uh, uh, trade with China, the businesses are already, in, you know, have a vested interest in in China, and you can't really get out China immediately. So that uh, the government has to has to take care of these interests, business interests, and not to intervene too much. Whereas uh, the government also wanted to control the uh, the uh, the two over dependence on China. So what uh, what government trying to do was to make sure that the uh, the government will give the guidance to the industry and to make sure that these particular strategic uh, material and strategic uh, items needs to be protected and needs to be secured and that is the government to provide the support for the industry to promote the diversification and building up the stockpile and uh, and reserves and also um, try to build up the uh, alternative goods to replace on the material that is uh, depending on China. So this is rather uh, positive uh, action by the government, not not to to enforce the regulations and regulate the businesses not to trade not to trade with China but to to give the positive incentives for uh, for the businesses to uh, to to change their behavior of you know simply taking all these uh, um, uh, uh, measures to uh, you know to to uh, to to work with China so I think one of the Im important point of this is that economic security is rather, you know, instinctively against the economic rationality. You know, econ you know, if you if you are a businessman and you know you want to you want to have a you want to make your uh, uh, business right, then you know it's it's much rational to uh, to to invest in China and trade with the traders with China because they are they are the cheapest and best products. But the uh, the government is asking the businesses to do something that is not instinctively right. Uh, but in order to impose, uh, improve the security, 
of you know the, to to avoid the weaponization or attack from the weaponization of the economy we need to provide something in re, you know something some incentives for the businesses to do something that is not you know uh, the the animal spirits of of the businesses thank you kazuto san for uh, you know detailed description of what seems to be happening uh, in the Japanese regulatory side and how business sectors have been responding. And I would like to raise a, some difficult question to Robert. Um, I, I wonder, we, we are on the right track on this uh, economic security policy. And uh, I think the overall theme of the G1 is the rolling of the 20s. and. Back in 1920, we always recall the Great Recession into the, uh, you know, 1929 and 1930s, and everybody got into the protectionism that led to the, uh, you know, uh, all the disasters that we experienced in 1940s. So, with the more regulations uh, on the economy and the supply chain reforms that uh, really, you know, detach ourselves from the global. Uh, markets uh, to be more like a strategize uh, in a way of reformulating our business uh, activities. How can we navigate ourselves to, you know, uh, you know, promote our policy into the right track to coexist that economic rationalities uh, and also those uh, strategic goals can be met uh, with each other? Gosh, I've got uh, two <laughs> minutes to answer this, so that's, um, that's quite a challenge. Um, I think one thing is that we're not going to go back to what we had pre-global uh, gr financial crisis. I mean, that's just not that's just not happening. Um, the death or death of or end of comparative advantage as we knew it. Um, globalization is changing, um, and and so on and so on. So we are in a. I think in the first panel again, uh, we're talking about sort of a new geopolitical age. So and we have to have new geopolitical tools uh, to deal with that new geopolitical uh, age. So I think there are a couple, having said that, I think there are a couple of sort of guide guardrails that we absolutely need to uh, put round. And one is that um, economic security remains open, looks outward and not looks inward, because I see a lot of economic security discussion now uh, that really focuses on, um, in effect, be becoming autarkic. Uh, and I think that is... Um, as a sort of a, an instinctive free marketer, I see lower growth, as I said, fragmentation, more regulations, uh, more geopolitics in, in, uh, having to be discussed in the C-suite and so on. So um, try to keep uh, economic security outward looking. Um, I think this point about, as I said earlier, that uh, economic security needs, you need to have friends uh, doing this. And uh, the trouble with this, of course, is easy to say, but the trouble with this is that uh, each country's definition of economic security is slightly different. So um, when she was Foreign Secretary uh, and now Prime Minister, Liz Truss, uh, she talked about the, and, uh, trying, to, trying to develop an economic NATO. Uh, and I've been talking a bit about that in, uh, in Tokyo, and a lot of people haven't heard of it. And when I mentioned it, they were a little bit worried, and like, what on earth does this mean? But I think what she's trying to get at is um, to sort of, try, I mean, in a sense, the G7 at the moment with regard to Ukraine is functioning as a, as a sort of economic NATO. Um, but it's nice in, in theory, but in practice, how do you align all your economic security needs? Because each economy, of course, uh, is different. And of course, then you have to answer to voters um, and so on. Um, and just a sort of final, as a coda to, um, to that, I think what, uh, what Kazuto said about government and business is absolutely critical. Because I think this is one of the, the sort of new bits of the uh, business and of the global business environment is that business and government have to start talking to each other in a completely different way. And that means also that governments have to try to understand how businesses work. And if you can find me a bureaucrat that understands supply chains, um, I'll give you five pounds, not that it's worth very much at the moment, but if you can find me that, because that is a sort of skill that governments are going to need to uh, introduce, because uh, as you will know, an M MNC supply chain can be sort of 10,000 companies long. Uh, and, so, and that's for, for government and for business, of course. It's this trying to keep abreast of what's going on. 
And of course, the legislation is that Japan has, the economic security legislation is now being operationalized. That will have inevitably result in a lot, of, a lot of things that companies have to do. It's one thing if you're an MNC. What if you're one of those, those sort of Japan's um, bed, economic bedrock of SMEs? How on earth do they keep uh, track of what they're doing? They may not even know that they're infringing economic security uh, regulations. So it's a complete change, I think, in government business relations, but also to try and keep economic security policy outward looking. So before opening up the floor, I would like to ask Bida, uh, because um, you, you've been researching on China for long years, and uh, you've just described about a uh, very vivid case about uh, the change of the you know Chinese uh, economic statecraft towards uh, European states. Now that we do have lots of audiences uh, from the private sectors uh, who may have lots of business relation with China, what would be your advice? Given that uh, you've known the sequence of the changes of the Chinese uh, government uh, and uh, uh, current developments of the US-China strategic uh, competition, what would be the specific advice that you can give to those private sectors who maintain the business with China? Thank you. Well, that's, that's a tough question, definitely. And that's probably the question that many are asking themselves now in, in the companies and in the governments as well. Well, one thing, and probably that's why I wanted to talk about the, the example of like the experience of Lithuania, the example maybe, that's a, that's a more accurate phrase. Um, this time is that, well, everyone has to be aware. Everyone has to be aware that there is this capacity and this capacity can be exercised when necessary. Then I would still, well, as a China scholar probably, I would still be cautious in generalizing this experience because that's an essential element here that that, that, was, well, that was the case which involves Taiwan's status. And if we look how China has ex exercised its economic statecraft, economic tools, well, in, in uh, specific foreign policy uh, objectives and pursuing those, Taiwan question has been a very, very special one, very, very specific, right? And like, well, very special, sorry. And that's why I would say that these extreme, extreme measures that China might be willing to take, that actually, well, applies for the situation which are relevant, well, related to Taiwan or otherwise, like, somehow very broadly national security of China. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's the main advice, be, to be aware. And then at the same time, probably, uh, well, at the, at the government level, I, I see this tendency which, what well, worries me a lot, but what I have been seeing in Europe, is that it's this economic security and, well, strengthening of economic security at times gets a very, uh, at least in Lithuania, right, uh, a very anti-China path. And I'm not sure if this is the 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 good path to go, like good good path to take because at the at the end where does it lead us to? It leads to extreme well fragmentation. They're like who are your friends? Like you have to you have to have friends, right? As uh, as it was said. But then it very clearly defines like well not a friend and a friend. And for businesses, I think this is becoming a little bit of an issue. Well, at least in Europe too. How, what what countries are considered friends and not friends? So, well, to be aware, and then, like I said, uh, summing up, right, that it's, it's in a particular case, and th that was not my purpose to, show, to, to depict China as an evil. Like I said, it still tends to use positive, uh, positive tools, economic tools, uh, even though that helps China to achieve, uh, achieve its uh, goals. And even when it uses those extremely negative uh, measures, sanctions, that's, that's in case of very, very specific uh, policy issues well, from the Chinese perspective. So be aware of the uh, possible capacities of Chinese state, then well, be aware of the issues that could be involved as the governments change policies. And that mainly applies probably for the European, uh, for the well, EU probably, as the major changes in regards to China are taking place now. And we will see a lot of changes in, within the EU, I think, in their stance towards China and Taiwan, uh, I think in a, in a rel relatively short period of time. Thank well, thank you very much, Vida. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, open the floor from now. I might take uh, three questions uh, in a row uh, and then to go back. So first, second, or third. Okay, first question. 
thank you very much for uh, a fruitful discussions. And uh, my, at first, uh, my comments were uh, f um, fragmentations of the world. And second, is the rather than uh, you know economic rationality, uh, we will be we have to obey f uh, for uh, economic security. Three, uh, economic security needs a friends. And from the point of the management of the company, I'm ask, I'd like to uh, ask you uh, what, uh, may, what define the uh, friends of each uh, market, since uh, that's going to be our definitions over a market and a partnership. So uh, for example, semiconductor, food, energy, those three markets is very important. The criticality will be different. So uh, what define the market? Thank Great. you. So who are the friends? What defines the market? Shikata-san, please. <laughs> well, thank you very much um, for your very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Um, I would like to uh, ask your views on kind of international rulemaking uh, of uh, economic security. And uh, I, I was based in Beijing, Beijing until three years ago, and I was following, for example, Alibaba's smart city uh, export, you know, in the in the context of uh, BRI and so forth, and we don't want to see, you know, big brother brother watching you. So, whether uh, there is uh, any opportunities for such rulemakings in the context of uh, IPEF, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Frameworks, or Quad, uh, G7, among others, uh, in addition to existing uh, U.S. Japan. Uh, collaboration in this uh, area. All right, so third question, and now we're going to go for a second round. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, quantum computing, um, particularly from China and the US, you know, and Japan is well behind the eight ball right now. So and that's, that's both technology, positive, negative, and offensive and defensive. So. Where do you see that? Particularly China has satellites now which they're able to do with quantum computing. I don't think the US has done that yet. So that's the sort of thing you should be looking at, I think, in terms of uh, security, economic security in particular. OK, thanks. So I'd like to back to the panelists. First, Robert, would you like to talk about first, second, probably, the questions? Uh, <clears throat> yes. So uh, thank you, Ken. Um, so how to define? Friends, I think that was your your question, and that that is that is the difficulty with economic security because each country, as I said earlier, has a slightly different uh, set of exports, a set of issues, set of things they're worried about, uh, and so on. So, just as sort of a coda to uh, what Vida said um, uh, about uh, about China, you know, one shouldn't demonise China um, because it's going to be the second. It is the second largest economy in the world. Many companies depend on it. So. For example, Japan's sort of unique position, I think, is this, this sort of drawing red lines, but also uh, trying to keep engaging. I think that's a really important message uh, to the rest of the world, actually. You can't lock China out, it's too big. So I think, um, thinking about your question, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis, and this is why these, sort of these, co these um, coalitions of the like-minded, not they don't necessarily think the same, but there's sort of things that chime with the, with, the, uh, with, these, with the countries, for example, the G7 at the moment with regard to, to Russia and Ukraine. Um, that's a very sort of strongly cohesive uh, reaction that they've, that they've managed to achieve. Uh, but um, that's a particular set of circumstances with a particular set of countries with a particular set of interests. Um, but other, other issues may, uh, may not have that same sort of sense of cohesion. So I think it's about constantly uh, talking to each other, uh, so at this openness point, uh, constantly just trying to look for areas um, of, that, of intersection. Um, but it is a very sort of slippery concept, this uh, economic security. But it, your question goes to the heart, I think, of the challenge uh, to policymakers. Um, the second one uh, from Shikata-san was on um, uh, rulemaking of economic security. Um, and quite rightly mentioned the, the, the smart cities and so on. And, of course, the tech space is a very thinly governed space at the moment. So it's up, the rules are up for grabs. And, of course, China thinks uh, has, in, is in some respects, quite legitimate claim on wanting to be part of that rulemaking because of its size. I think where the rulemaking is likely to take place, and this comes back to, the, again, the first session that we had, um, is less now in the WTO and, and the UN, obviously, 
um, the sort of traditional sort of Bretton Woods, um, uh, if you like, uh, era um, of institutions, probably more in these new uh, uh, groupings that have emerged uh, to reflect strategic needs. Um, we, we talked a lot about CPTPP at the beginning uh, of the day, and I think that is an important, as Conor Taro said, an important, uh, it's less, less about trade for me than, than about rulemaking, actually. Um, you mentioned IPEF. Uh, IPEF had a lot of drew a lot of flack when it when it was announced, and of course it is nebulous, and it has to be because the U.S. isn't going to rejoin the uh, join the CPTPP. It's just, it's just not the way that U.S. politics is going to work. But I thought what was interesting about uh, IPEF is that India is actually at the table, uh, and it walked out of RCEP and obviously couldn't uh, get into the CPTPP, and also that South Korea is at the table in an Indo-Pacific construct. And that's, I think this is the first time that that has actually happened. So I think these sort of trade blocks and these new groupings are where rules are going to be increasingly made. Okay, Kazuto, I, I can only think about you about dealing with uh, quantum computing questions. So uh, if you could deal in addition to what, what you want to say about this. Sure, about um, well first, uh, the quantum computing, Japan, is not exactly the very, uh, you know, the, the behind what China does. I think the United States, Europe, I mean, each country has a different element of, uh, of the quantum computing uh, program, but uh, it, it is indeed China uh, which goes in, the, in front. Um, the problem is that we are not exactly sure what quantum computing can do or quantum technology, quantum encryptions, quantum sensing, you know, there are, there are a variety of ways of using the quantum technologies, but nobody knows what will be the final outcome of using those quantum technologies. And nobody even see the quantum computer, for example. And so, so I think there are, there are lots of this emerging technology issue is uh, r rather risky and it's, it's more like a gamble that you invest heavily on these technologies which are promising but not exactly sure that what uh, the, the future can be. So I think China is in a sort of a very advantageous or uh, uh, advantageous position to, to do such a gamble because you know there, there was a, it is the government which takes all the risks, and you know if it fails, you know it's just the government say okay, let's get you know you know let's just forget about it and get you know go be, uh, you know move forward. The problem in J Japan and and United States and others are that you know it's it's. It associates with the risks for the investment by the companies or or um, or the researchers, etc. So, I think how to mitigate all these risks of the you know challenging on on the new technology is the one of the key issue for developing the uh, uh, economic security and one of the four pillars of the economic security promotion law is to promote the uh, promote the state of art technology which includes the quantum computing or quantum technology so i think japan is on the right path but how much it can allocate the funding for that is the next question thank you bida i'll, I'll get back to you soon uh, but before i'd like to collect the question gentlemen at the back and i think there are are some questions from the online and also there. So, um, the, and, and then I'll, I'll get back to the panels. I would like to um, uh, hear your d d discussions on um, digital or data uh, weaponization. Uh, this m may sound a little out of scope uh, today's discussion, but I don't think we can overlook. Um, I understand that uh, weaponization requires high dependency uh, Japanese government selected hyperscalers, mostly U.S., for uh, government cloud these days. On the other hand, from the members of the Diet, insists that is needed, uh, that Japanese uh, providers are needed for uh, data or digital sovereignty. Right. How do you balance these two? Okay, great. Ferdinand says. Uh, so. <coughs> Oh, please, uh, uh, gentleman at the back. 
perhaps a uh, simplistic question, but my impression is that uh, China has not been successful with uh, some of the coercion um, in recent years. Does, is it true that bullying backfires? And if it is true that bullying backfires, does uh, the Beijing government understand this? And or more sophisticatedly, are the factions within the Beijing government taking different positions on bullying, uh, uh, you know, on whether bullying backfires? Excellent. So please, uh, from the online. So we have one question, which I will read it now. The world normalizes the over-influence of superpowers in international system through the legitimization of nuclear and military power within the fundamental structure of the United Nations, especially through the UN Security Council. However, why should the UN 2.0 be developed on the same assumptions rather than one of greater equality between states? Why should the 21st century world accept the reductionist, realist view of the world and allow the retrograde assumptions, even if reflecting a degree of reality of commentators like John Merschmeyer, who basically assumes and believes that it is normal, acceptable, and inevitable that great powers do and will bully all other countries. Well, that requires a <laughs> whole semester <laughs> of response. But I, uh, that, that's a great, I mean, uh, you know, setting for the final remarks. And I think everybody have a 90 seconds to wrap things up. I'd like to ask Bida, uh, especially to respond to uh, Feldman's, uh, Feldman's essay's question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'll try to, to grasp probably many things in, in, one, in one answer that, uh, well, whether bullying backfires, indeed, it, it does backfire because I believe that China's expectation was that, well, they send a warning and at the receiving end, right, as it was said, at the receiving end there would be some, well, accommodations, like Lithuania would drop some, uh, some policies or, or not. Instead, what has happened, I would say that not only in Lithuania, but also more broadly in the region, Central Eastern Europe, or even in the EU, uh, there has been this, well, even more growing awareness of, of possible implications of too deep of an engagement with China. So I would, I would call this as a, indeed the, the result of this, well, of this uh, measures taken by China. That's, that's how it has backfired. And then, which also brings me to the question of like, well, who are the friends? Everyone needs friends and who that would be. The discourse of that now is kind of, well, or has been, well, it has emerged already probably lately, that the division line is the regime type. It's more of like authoritarian and the, the democracies, which, which is not necessarily thinking about economic, uh, economics and well, markets. It's probably not the, 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 best, uh, the best line to divide the world. In, but that's what we see and that's how friends are being determined by, well, whether they depend, belong to one camp or another. But again, seen from Europe, that's a little bit different experience, right? When we have Russia next, to, especially like Eastern Europe, uh, then China is being put on par with Russia. Uh, sorry, yes, with Russia. And that's, again, that's a part of this uh, backfiring indeed. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I wonder who takes the Mia Scheimer question. <laughs> but uh, uh, next I'd like to go to Kastosan. I'll leave a Mia Shima question to Robert. So um, I'll, I'll just uh, respond to the uh, digitalization or digital um, digital sovereignty. Yes, I think. Well, yes, it is. It is uh, better to have the data localization, having all this uh, national system. But mind you, that it is important to have the security intact. I mean. Uh, Sorry if I offend you, uh, but uh, um, the Fujitsu, for example, had uh, has employed the, uh, as a, as a national system to provide a domestic cloud uh, for the government, and then there was a the failure, technical failure takes place, and uh, and it is exposed to the uh, the threats. And so, if we depend, on the, you know, the national industry is not the the, the angel. It's not the panacea. You know, national government, uh, no, national industry may have, f you know, the faulty, uh, uh, faulty uh, uh, systems. You know, we can't really glorify and uh, and uh, that the Japanese industry are the best, and uh, and we can let this happen. You know, if we let the Japanese companies take, you know 
being in charge, and therefore everything is okay. Um, I think we need to make sure that we have to, we have to balance those risks. If we let the foreign companies, like friend companies, you know, the, the companies from the United States, uh, dealing with the good domestic, uh, you know, the governmental uh, crowd, is it better to have the, you know, a little dodgy Japanese crowd? Or, you know, it's, these are the balance that you need to take. And I think, you know, being a foreign is not automatically means bad. So you have to think about you know, what is the best way of, of choosing. And this is different from the idea of the traditional sovereignty. And uh, you know, the traditional sovereignty, you have to take control in everything. But you know, in case of economy, there is always the technical differences and technical superiorities. And you know, I, I think if everything in Japan is the better than any other countries, then, you know, being an Turkish uh, or, or, or Turkic choice is good, but again, uh, I, I think uh, we, need to, uh, we need to take the risks in the much wider sense and not just uh, hang on to the idea of nationality. Okay, let's have an extra one minute uh, to give, uh, our, you know, Robert uh, final words. Thank you, Ken. And the, this, this red light is flashing at me, so <laughs> making me very nervous. But very quickly, on digital, uh, the data, it's the right thing to ask because this is absolutely critical to economic security as well. Um, I'm, I'm pessimistic, actually, because you've got Chinese data sovereignty, you've got Russia data sovereignty, uh, you've got um, India worrying about data colonialism, uh, you've got U the EU with its own data views, you've got the US with its own views of pr data privacy and so on, and you've got the, uh, Japan's data free flow with trust, a, a wonderful thing in theory, but really hasn't made much uh, headway. So I think this is uh, something that is, uh, is, is going to be difficult for companies to, uh, to navigate. And on the realism thing, um, I, I just find realism so depressing, actually, <laughs> for starters. I mean, it's just so, it assumes no norms, no morals, uh, dog-eat-dog world, and we know that we can do uh, better uh, than that. If we'd have uh, gone with the realists, we'd have just let Russia do what it wanted to do in Ukraine, and no way in, on earth is that, uh, in my view, uh, even morally acceptable. I think one of the... Um, one of the, th my final point actually uh, is around this, I think UN 2.0 is very difficult because uh, the scale is, it would be so big. But I think one of the things to look in the sort of the new world is the, um, is the influence of the new non-aligned countries. And we can see that emerging again as a result of Ukraine-Russia issue uh, in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, uh, in India with its own um, sort of ambivalence on certain issues. I think this, it, their role in influencing what goes on between the two, the two poles, the China pole and the, and the US pole, I think is going to be interesting to watch and, and be important. That was an excellent wrap up. And, uh, uh, now the time is up, uh, so I'd like to close the session. Please join me in thanking those excellent discussion for those panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.